Thank you so much for playing along. Right, we are now going to introduce our wonderful panelists uh, to all of you. We're going to, I'm going to invite them to, uh, in time honor tradition, embark on an elevator pitch. So in roughly 45 minutes, uh, 45 <laughs> seconds, <laughs> ooh, ooh, that, that, that almost went terribly wrong. 45 <laughs> seconds to one minute, starting with your good self, Sharon. Just talk a little bit about what you do and what area of AI are you looking at? Of course, thank you. So I lead strategy for EY's global emerging tech ecosystem, which means uh, I'm looking after and curating a portfolio of relationships with startups, scale-ups, and investors who are bringing the latest and best technology to, to enterprises. So in regards to AI, we're really across the board, all sectors that we operate in, a lot of geographies, but with a heavy emphasis on enterprise technology. So everything from cyber AI to kind of platformization through to the latest foundation model. So not just gen AI, but actually going back to the older forms of AI as well. Mm -hmm. Excellent stuff. Uh, that's a, a strong opening gambit there. And I like the fact that you've differentiated between gen AI and you know some of the other definitions of AI and concepts that have been around for a while. And we're going to move from your good self, Sharon, to your good self, Axel. Um, introduce yourself to the good people here today. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Um, uh, I'm with Deutsche Telekom. I'm heading Hubraum. Hubraum is the brand and the program to work with young startups. Um, so we bring at the earliest moment, possible moment relevant innovation into the group. And how are we doing this? On one hand, of course, we collaborate and co-create together with the startups, but we also invest. Deutsche Telekom can invest from seed with like um, uh, several hundred thousands to like double-digit million tickets. And uh, the key areas of AI for us are, of course, around customer service and um, optimizing our network infrastructure. All right, tremendous. Nicole, thank you, Axel. Over to yourself, Nicole. So as the growth venture fund for Toyota, we are really looking for startups globally that can really help us you know, move faster, better, stronger. So looking to apply AI across a number of different applications within uh, the different Toyota business units and groups as we think about the future of mobility. I'm also Canadian, living in Tokyo. So as another side, I'm looking for ways to AI help me find the best sushi restaurant so that I can uh, eat my way across the country. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent, thank you so much. And your good self, Quinn. Yeah, my name is Quinn Lee. I'm a, a senior vice president, go head of Qualcomm Ventures. So we're the venture capital arm for Qualcomm. I'm based out of San Diego, California. We invest globally in startups that are synergistic with the Qualcomm ecosystem. The goal is really to invest in companies we can work with, partner with, to help us expand our reach. Uh, we've been doing this for the last 23 years, have a portfolio of 150 companies globally that's valued at over $2 billion. And in areas of AI, what we're interested in is, many of the AI is deployed in the cloud, but we're building a lot of technologies that's powering many devices, including the phone, automotive, IoT devices. And we're interested in bringing a lot of these AI technology to be able to run on device. So we're interested in companies, developers, building innovative AI use cases, applications to run on these variety of form of devices. Nice, exciting times. As we might say in the music business, this panel is all killer, no filler. Mm -hmm. <laughs> we bought you stars from all over the world. Now, Quinn, I'd like to stay with your good self. Uh, talk to us a bit about, you know, it's a complicated landscape. How do you go about identifying and prioritizing the AI opportunities that really align with your strategic objectives? Sure. So we have been looking at the AI ecosystem for the last probably four or five years before even JI came along. So we announced a fund in back in November 20. Uh, 18, uh, $200 million fund to invest in a broader AI ecosystem. But in particular, how we look at AI is we looked at the whole stack. So there's uh, underlying silicon technology, which we're building, but then there's machine learning opera um, operation platforms, companies like Hugging Face, which we're investor of, weights and biases. And then we're also looking at vertical use cases for different use cases of AI. How does the use cases, could be enterprise use case, could be consumer use cases. They're typically deployed both in the cloud as well as on device. So it could be a phone, could be cars, could be other low power IoT devices. 
So that's how we're looking at both on the horizontal platform side as well as vertical use cases. Outstanding, that's really helpful, thank you. And would anyone else like to jump in in terms of how you identify and prioritize these opportunities? Are there any examples that you'd like to share with the good people here? Axel, you look like a man with an answer, yeah. not far away. Look, um, uh, in the end it's all about like um, solving customer problems with technology. Yes. And um, in that sense, uh, the start of our um, uh, scouting and investment activities is always a customer problem that comes from the business units because in the end we try to invest strategically to support the businesses to do a better job for our customers. And um, uh, if, as you can imagine, as Deutsche Telekom is uh, a large telco operator, we have tons of data, we have a lot of customer interactions, so these are the sources, um, uh, the customer problems that we um, should help to solve, and that's the areas how we then scout proactively, but also reactively, um, uh, get inflow of deal flow um, and uh, look into these companies. Indeed, I mean, like what you're all kind of identifying is, you know, the corporate world is, you know, the, the bigger companies, they have a lot of, they might have legacy, they might have a lot of infrastructure, and so you have to really keenly identify the AI that makes sense. Now, Nicole, I'd like to uh, come over to you, good self. Could you talk about the role of corporate innovation in terms of providing that pinpoint to find the right opportunities and the right tech to adopt? So we work bottom up, so we spend a lot of time with the different business units within the Toyota group. And so this can be any from anybody working on connected cars to you know, shipping and material handling, to hydrogen, to electrification, vehicle to grid, all of these different areas. And so there are tasks with building a product, putting it out to market, iterating on a product, and we're there to basically tell them what's going on in the market. And a lot of these um, engineers have worked with you know, Toyota for 20-some you know, years. They're often hardware engineers, and so AI isn't something that you know, they're thinking about on a daily basis. Of course, you know, they, they're, it's something that they're aware of. And so we can actually bring very specific use cases, very specific applications to them from startups, from the market, to really help them think about how they could apply AI to solve some of these problems that they're working on. So we're actively doing that on a regular basis, you know, with business units across, you know, all the different geographies in, in Toyota. Yeah. Phenomenal, Sharon. If, if I may jump in, actually, it's not just working with the business around the challenges they see and helping them understand the new technologies coming on board, but also the new business models. The fact that these are newer companies, maybe not the same providers that they've kind of grown their careers with and helping them understand how to build these relationships and kind of create their own ecosystem of what's the new wave of what's out there. So. Yeah, indeed. Yeah. Well said, Axel. Yeah. yeah, and if I may jump on this, um, uh, business model. So um, you may have seen in the press or at our booth at Dodge Telecom that we present a concept of a smartphone that has no apps. So there's a uh, AI interaction concierge on there and that does everything. You don't have to go to um, Skyscanner or Booking.com to uh, book a journey, yeah, uh, a trip. Um, that is all done in one. And this is what you're referring to, like how um, business models, yeah. but also customer experience may be dramatically disrupted uh, by these new um, opportunities of a AI and Gen AI. Wow, a handset with no apps, hashtag mind blown. I'm going to be over to your booth a bit later to see that. Um, but Quinn, I'd like to come back to yourself now. How do you think that AI is perhaps helping to redefine how large corporates can work with startups? Do you think it's opening up uh, some new ways of collaboration? Yeah, absolutely. So um, maybe I'll just use that as an example. The AI ecosystem evolving so fast. There are so many developers building interesting use cases and applications on AI. And we provided technology that runs a lot of devices, right? For the phones, the Android phones, you have for the automotives and IoT devices. So we just partnered actually with Hugging Face, which is one of the leading AI developer communities. Brilliant. To host uh, many of these AI models, and many of these models can run on device. So we have uh, cloud-based Snapdragon powered devices that's online that the developer can go to Hugging Face or AI Hub, Qualcomm's AI Hub, and deploy these models across different Snapdragon devices we have hosted in the cloud. So that's one way we're partner with the leading AI uh, developer community player, Hugging Face, to uh, advance our overall objective of proliferation of AI models and applications. 
Oh, I love that example. I met the good people at Hugging Face at an event run by Ultralytics who are out here today. Uh, what's up, amigos? And uh, they had a wonderful young lady from Hugging Face come along and she just like knocked our socks off. It was so cool. On my laptop backstage, there was a Hugging Face sticker. It's one of my favorites. Um, but Nicole, I'd like to come over to your good selves because you know, we're painting a very rosy picture. It's you know, wonderful to integrate, bring these startups on board, but it's not without its risks or its fears. Now talk to us a bit about how you kind of would mitigate any risks in terms of investing in AI startups. So I've worked at a couple of different funds over the last 10 years, and before joining uh, Toyota and Woven, I was with Sidewalk Labs, which is uh, an alphabet company thinking about sustainable cities in Toronto. And we dealt with this a lot, uh, particularly with technology in general, but you know, AI specifically, and really you know, helping you know, the average person. I, my poor mother, I use her as an example every time. And she has now discovered what AI is, because recently she asked me when I was at a conference, was I going to see the AI? Was I going to go look at it? And <laughs> was it in, yeah, I'm like, mom, it's not in a box. Like, it's, 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 it's different, I'll explain it to you at Christmas time. But, <laughs> uh, it, like, how do you actually help not only your own corporation that has very sophisticated people you know, thinking about this and addressing this, but how do you also help the consumer of your, your product or, their, or you know, your customer's product, how do you help them think about it? Because they might also be differing levels of sophistication depending on the use case. And so what's really important, what we thought a lot about when I was at Sidewalk and you know, what I think a lot of us are thinking now is like what are the governance models that you can put in place to think about you know, ethical AI and even training the models, you know, thinking about diversity. Like, there's all of these other things that are really coming in that are just outside the technology development, which is very interesting, and we need new business models, and we need new ecosystems, but we actually have to think about this, this whole picture holistically, and so I think that's a real challenge that, you know, some people are doing quite well in addressing it, and, you know, others are still struggling with it. Yeah, well said, well said. And I love the point you make about diversity because it does seem to be an Achilles heel in some companies. Um, uh, you know, but it kind of makes sense. If you're not seeing a diversity of viewpoints and perspectives around your boardroom table, uh, it makes sense that there's chunks of awareness missing that will trip up any company. Um, but Sharon, I'd like to come over to yourself. Do you think that this world of emerging and exciting new technology does that uh, re-emphasize the importance of diversity, or what do you think that means in terms of our approach to operationalizing diversity? Absolutely, that's a great question. Um, I think the best way to think about this is that this is an opportunity, and it's an opportunity in which we can use AI to address issues that we perceived in diversity, whether it's, whether it's kind of generational, or it could be ratio or it could be gender based or it could be a number of other different factors but likewise if we don't seize on this opportunity then there are then effectively we've only strengthened the system that's already in place mm -hmm. now what's really interesting about ai is that where the de and i comes in place for uh, within ai is that there's a number of different layers you can take it there's obviously the foundation models themselves and what you're doing with them and making sure the applications and the, the data they're trained on is unbiased or as unbiased as you can make it, potentially, or at least understanding what biases there exist. We live in an imperfect world. But then there's also just the training around the processes, the structures, the questions and things that just raising the idea and introducing AI into your company will raise and having that in the back of your mind. Yeah, yeah, indeed. I mean, you mentioned biases there. I'm going to come back to yourself, Nicole, because you had a doozy there. Now, I believe it was uh, one of the voice assistants that didn't quite respond in the way that it should. Talk. Could you share that with the audience? So my husband says uh, that I don't speak clearly, and it's not um, his fault that I'm always having to tell him he doesn't listen to me uh, because we actually have a voice assistant at home. And often, you know, she doesn't respond to me. However, when I deepen my voice, she does. It's very clear. And so it happens, it happens probably about 25% of the time. Oh. Uh, and so I really think it's just important to have that diversity you know, as you're going through um, you know, kind of the, the product development cycle to really be able to engage your entire audience. Yeah. And I think it becomes even more important yeah, um, the more the, the, the speed of innovation advances now with a AI. And so how we try to cope with that is um, we have given us at Deutsche Telekom like this the, these guiding principles uh, and uh, the overarching headline is um, human-centered technology. Yeah. So, and this is not only the, the ethical side, but it's also the user um, experience side. And um, uh, 
we checking every product that we're developing and working on uh, in these dimensions uh, with these principles to make sure that we don't fall into these traps and um, use the technology to the best benefit of our customers. Oh, I'm so glad you said that. This is exactly what I, I want to hear today on the stage. But, you know, it's not all plain sailing. There are, um, you know, ways of doing things in a company that are internal. There are external, you know, exciting new partners. Uh, you've got to engage in some kind of knowledge sharing and connectivity and all that kind of stuff. How do you square that circle of having, you know, kind of security and that, uh, that kind of confidence and safety within a company, but then welcoming external startups into the fold? Is there any best practices that anyone has found in terms of matching the internal and the external worlds with these projects? I mean, if, it, if it's I, silence, th th maybe somebody can tell me later, because I, I, th I think it's a difficult question. You know, how do you square that circle? Yes. I mean. Quinn, thank you. You, you. you go for it. Oh, Sharon, please. I thank mean, you. I was just going to say that at the end of the day, we are still very relationships driven. Yes. And it's all about how do you build that trust. And it, there, so to the point, there's no easy answer. But it's about having trust from the startup side that they will be able to deliver on the technology they're promising. Yeah. And the startups having trust in the corporate that the interest is genuine, that you actually really want to engage with them, partner with them, and help nurture them, recognizing that they are where they are in their maturity. So I, it's not an answer to your question, but it's kind of a oh, like leading it. point into why a lot of companies get it wrong. Absolutely, it sounds like uh, startup-centered corporate innovation. Even yeah. you know, moving, riffing from the human, human-centered design. Yeah. Quinn, you had a, a, a comment lined up. Thank you. Yeah, I think w well, one of the ways we, how we work with startup is through investments. Right. So right. we have this massive portfolio of companies all around the globe, and once we uh, make an equity investment in these companies, we're very motivated to help these companies both grow as an independent company and also help them to collaborate with Qualcomm. Right, so we're the champions, if you will, of the startups within the big corporation of a Qualcomm. So for example, in our booth, uh, if, you, if you visit, there's a startup company called Humane, which has developed this innovative product, a wearable product that you wear on your uh, shirt or jacket. It's called an AI pin. Um, they're a customer of ours, they're partners of ours, and we're also investor in the company. So through these events, and other, they're getting a lot of traction, a lot of people looking at their product, and that's a one way of us you know, showing our partnership, showing our commitment to them, and get them to expose to a very, very broad audience in this, in this show. Yeah, yeah that's, I like that example, Axel, yeah. yeah. And look, it's always also a question of our buy-build partner, yeah? yeah. So um, uh, on one hand, it's about investing or even buying a majority, yeah? On the other hand, it's like, what do we really want to own ourselves? Uh, most likely not uh, the model, uh, but um, uh, maybe use cases on top of that, or some horizontal integration layer, um, uh, a multimodal um, uh, integration layer. Um, and then um, there are partner cases, and uh, to take the case of Humane, Humane in US runs on uh, T-Mobile connectivity. Yeah, it is a partnership, it is maybe not like a far-reaching product-related uh, partnership, but it's an enabling, um, uh, and uh, this can lead to, to more. So um, uh, it's always the question, where's our route right to play, our route right to stay, and, and then going down these routes. Yeah, indeed. Uh, Sharon, what's the EY take on this, um, these possibilities build, buy, and partner? Would you have any advice for any startups that are you know, looking to work with corporates? Sure. I mean, so much advice, but I guess it distills down to, and this is not the, I'm sure, most welcoming answer. It really depends on the circumstance. So from an EY perspective, we are in so many sectors, so many parts of a corporate corporation, and we've seen quite a lot of challenges. And there are definitely challenges that are unique to a client, in which case it might make sense to build something very specific and very unique and customized. And then there are certain challenges that all businesses have, such as around the customer engagement or around kind of the financial transformation, in which case, absolutely, we are always happy to look at startups, scale-ups that have something really interesting. The thing I challenge them most though, and I think it'd be quite similar from an investment perspective, is kind of what makes you really unique as, re as relative to your clients. You can talk about how you stand out in the market because you have X, Y, and Z capability, but is it actually selling, uh, solving a problem? 
Do you actually have a defensible moat in the solution you're building so that the next customer that comes along won't look at that and say, actually, we can probably build it in a, a something similar in about a year's time, even if a year is an age by startup standards. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, indeed, yeah. well said. Thank you, Sharon. That's some sage advice there. Um, I would love to direct the same question to your good self, Quinn. I mean, have you got any pointers in terms of the kind of companies that startups should be focusing on in terms of achieving potential collaborations? Yeah, so um, when we invest in startup companies, we look for two things, right? One is obviously we're deploying capital, we want to make a return on investment. The other thing we're looking at is how does that company's products or service fit with Qualcomm? So we're looking really for companies could either develop devices that could use our technology or maybe even software companies build AI use cases that could be deployed around the devices that's powered by our chips. So it's really trying to find a fit. If we can find a fit with, with us, then we can partner with, work with them. That, that's when the win-win situation sort of comes about. Not every case is going to work, but we're trying really hard to find that fit, if you will, with, with, with us, with our product groups, and, and with the product portfolio. Excellent. Yeah, that sounds very much like establishing partnerships there. Now, Axel, I was going to come to your good self. Now, I know that you have some really kind of solid advice with a focus on technologies in terms of uh, any tips or any places that you'd advise startups to be thinking about or looking about in terms of getting that collaboration in the corporate world? Well, uh, very good question, and I don't know if the answer will be different in one week from now because <laughs> there's, there's so much, uh, it's, it's so much um, uh, yeah, going on there. Yeah. But I think a key question everyone needs to ask himself is, uh, or herself is like, um, how much am I really adding unique value um, or how much I'm just a wrapper or a thin wrapper around like existing models, yeah? So um, uh, what we currently look at is like how startups use like the advances in software computing power, but also uh, um, new devices in creating new experiences that are unique, ideally with um, uh, exclusive data. Um, and if on top of that, there's like even like an exclusive developer community around this, yeah? then this is, uh, these are cases that are stand out. But um, you need to be aware of that, um, and a lot of startups already have failed in the AI space, that it's an easy thing for the current uh, competitors like ChatGPT yeah. to expand their models with functionalities that once have been standalone business models, like um, reading through PDFs, and then suddenly it's just like an add-on um, for them. And this is something you really need to take care of. Sage the, advice, Sharon. Well, what I'd also add there is, particularly in a case like Gen AI, where the technology is so new, people are still learning what it is, much less thinking through how to use it. As a founder or you know someone who works in a startup looking to get into a corporate, you're not just educating your cl potential client on what your technology is, but you're actually teaching them how to measure what uh, the quality of what you do. So you actually you're not just creating your own market but also helping them to then be able to sell what you do and the value you bring to the business back to their own stakeholders. Yeah. So yeah, I would jump in and say, yeah. you have to think about, if you're a, a startup, you have to think about the corporate that you're dealing with. So as you know, Toyota, we're a car company, you know, we're looking at mobility and areas like that. If you're trying to come to us around battery technology, well, that's probably something that we'll do in-house. So if you think back to the earlier comment around build by partner, we also add invest to the end of that. And, you know, like some of those things are probably pretty core to what we're working on. So we're going to want to keep that in house. So there's probably a lot of hesitation and information sharing and dancing around the NDA and all of those types of things. But if it's something like AI, which is not necessarily something that you think of a car company or a mobility company necessarily having a deep expertise in, then you can add a lot of you know, value to us in that sense. And you know, as we think about you know, the, the stack of technology, my colleague had said this earlier today on a panel, you know, we don't necessarily need to own all of it. There's certain parts that are core to it, but if there's other parts that maybe need to be part of a broader ecosystem, or they aren't, you know, like we have a deep expertise in hardware engineers, but not AI engineers, then that's where you can add the value. So you can feel a lot more comfort that that's probably a good corporate partner for you to have. 
And how we operate is we like to think about it from the founder experience perspective. We actually have a whole second team called the Portfolio Success Team, and their entire job, they are motivated to be able to have the portfolio be successful. So, you know, corporate priorities come and go. You know, you might be dealing with like one arm of Toyota, but you know, we're a large company, maybe we can introduce you through other geographies or other teams. And their whole job is to kind of be your concierge and walk you through the company and really help you plan that collaboration roadmap. And so that's really how we're really trying to think about it. And AI is definitely an area that we can really use, you know, kind of um, some, some support and um, in, input from startups. Yeah, fantastic point. Thank you, Nicola. And I'd love to stay with yourself because um, I know you've got a really interesting background around sustainable cities and, you know, involving tech. And it's not, you know, we've been talking about ideal scenarios where everything just works, the startups, the corporates, they're all on the same page. What happens when you run into cultural blocks? I mean, how important is the question of culture in terms of, letting that innovation move forward? So it's really interesting. Uh, I've worked in a number of different organizations and some have sort of outside in innovation where they're looking to the market and trying to deploy it. Others are more inside out innovation. I've built something super cool, like let's see if we can sell it to the market. And I definitely feel like cities in particular are very interconnected and very messy and there's different levels of governance and sophistication. So, you know, ultimately it's getting back to, you know, what Axel was saying around like the human centered experience and the customer experience and like what problem are you really trying to solve for? And then how do you actually bring all the parties together to really try and figure out, you know, how all those parts are going to uh, continue to you know, jive and mix and be able to move forward. And a lot of this stuff is going to continue to iterate. You know, like you said, like, you know, next week I might have a different answer for you. So it's really important. You know, startups, I think, are really nimble and great at this. But um, as you know, corporates, it's really hard. And as us, you know, kind of playing these innovation roles within our corporates, it's also up to us to keep these conversations going with the executives and the decision makers within larger corporates that aren't used to things moving so fast. And it's really, uh, it's really risky and, and really tough for them. So how do we actually make sure that that dialogue is open so that they can get more comfort and understand you know, uh, the world that we live in and how we're bringing this and what role we can play? Indeed, so there you have it, my friends. Uh, life moves fast, but AI moves faster. I have a hard think about whether it's uh, build, buy, collaborate, but you know, what you need to do is get on board with some of these amazing individuals and companies here to move forward. My dear friends, please join me in giving your warmest, uh, warmest thank you to Sharon, Axel, Nicole, and Quinn. Thank you so much, that was absolutely brilliant.